Let us pray. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, Son of the living God, God most high, who has created me and formed my soul after your own divine image and likeness, and had made me capable of everlasting happiness. Grant that I may serve you, my Lord, my God and my Father, with a faithful heart, that I may fight against my sins with a holy hatred, and that all sinful passion and affection being destroyed within me, I may be renewed in perfect innocence of life. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who has given me for my use the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, and has granted them for my service and comfort. Permit, I beseech you, O Lord, that I may never abuse your creatures, but that all the works of your hands may tell of your goodness, and may lead me to admire, to know, and to love you. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, out of your affection for me, granted me to be born in the true Christian faith, and has mercifully brought me up from the beginning of my life, supplying me with food and the other necessaries for the nourishment and support of my body. May my heart find no relish except in and through you. May you alone possess my innermost soul. May I exceedingly hunger for you, the bread of heaven, and thirst for you, the fountain of life, so that this life's exile ended, I may deserve to be satisfied with the joys of your eternal perfection. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who up until this time has preserved and delivered me from countless dangers of soul and body, even when I abused your gifts not deserting me. Illuminate my heart, I beseech you, with the brightness of your grace, that truly perceiving your goodness to me and my own ingratitude toward you, I may bemoan myself, I may be hateful in my own sight, but I may please you, my Creator and my only Redeemer, in all things. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I lie immersed in the most loathsome vices and was leading a most ungodly life, in your long-suffering bore with me for such a long time and brought me to repentance. Grant that my acceptable contrition and holy works I may expiate the stains of my past sin and that from now on I may lead a life of purity and love you above all things with most burning love. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I was on the brink of the very precipice and just within the jaws of hell, did not permit me to perish, but called me, though deaf, and trying to run from you to the way of salvation. Grant that from now on I may follow after you with humble devotion, and with a joyful heart correspond to your holy inspirations, with from my heart farewell to all things, and may cleave inseparably to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who always directed me, the vilest of sinners, has protected me, has looked upon me with the eyes of mercy, and still so fondly supports and cherishes me with your goodness, despite my daily transgressions, as if forgetful of all others. You cared for me alone. Grant that I also may love you most ardently, leaving all transitory things for your sake, and may think of you alone, and may with a ready mind and in all places follow and perform your holy will. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 23. The whole company of them rose up and brought him before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting the nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, the King. Pilate asked him, Are you the King of the Jews? He answered him, So you say. Pilate said to the chief priests and the multitudes, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, even to this place. When Pilate heard Galilee mentioned, he asked if the man was a Galilean. When he found out that he was in Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was extremely glad, for he'd wanted to see him for a long time, because he had heard many things about him. He hoped to see some miracle done by him. He questioned him with many words, but he gave no answers. The chief priests and the scribes stood, vehemently accusing him. Herod, with his soldiers, humiliated and mocked him, dressing him in luxurious clothing, they sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before that they had been enemies with each other. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me as one that perverts the people, and behold, having examined him before you, I find no basis for any charge against this man concerning those things with which you accuse him. Neither has Herod, for I sent you to him. And see, nothing worthy of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Now he had to release one prisoner to them because of the feast. But they cried out together, saying, Away with this man, release to us Barabbas, one who had been thrown into prison for a revolt in the city and for murder. Then Pilate spoke to them again, wanting to release Jesus, but they shouted out, Crucify! Crucify him! He said to them a third time, Why? What evil has this man done? I have known, found no capital crime in him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. But they were urgent, and with loud voices, asking that he be crucified. And their voices and the voices of the chief priests prevailed. Pilate decreed what they had asked for should be done. He released him who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus up to their will. When they led him away, they grabbed one Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it after Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We should note that the trials and suffering of Jesus Christ were essential to the perfection of his character as our great example. There have been in the world examples of patience, resignation and submission to the will of God. But there have been none like that of Jesus Christ. The sufferings of a Redeemer as a substitute for man have made a wondrous impression upon the human mind. Since the world began, no transaction like it has ever taken place. No expedient like it has ever been found to influence the human heart or stay the swelling tide of human corruption. The flood tide swept away a guilty world and the impression made by that dread manifestation of divine displeasure was soon forgotten. But the event of Calvary attracted the attention, affected the hearts, and changed the character of thousands. The impression, moreover, which it makes, is of the very, very character needed, an impression not more distinct of God's readiness to forgive sin than of his displeasure against sin. 
The cross of Christ is a demonstration of love, a warrant for confidence, an appeal to everything noble and generous about human nature. I question not the Redeemer's work took its peculiar form, as much to meet the feelings of human hearts, as to meet the requirements of God's justice and truth. Our feelings of God are naturally those of distrust and opposition, and that's simply because we are sinners. And these feelings must be mastered before we can be saved, and they must be mastered by an unequivocal, overwhelming demonstration of love. And we have it in the cross. For there God is in Christ, reconciling man to himself. The Redeemer was not compelled to suffer, but because he loved man so much, the thickening darkness of the curse only bound him the faster to his work. He saw, he endured, he triumphed under the influence of love to man. And now he not only shows us that we may trust him, but he addresses his appeal to our hearts. The cross was the expression of man's unbelief. Crucifixion was the death of the outcast only, the Gentile outcast. Crucify him then meant, let him die the worst of deaths, the Gentile death, the death that is so especially connected with the curse, the death that proclaims him not to be merely an outcast from Israel, an outcast from Jerusalem, but also an outcast from the Gentiles, even an outcast from the human race. It was thus that man rejected Christ, civilised man, educated man, religious man. It showed thus the natural heart speaking out, and showed the depths of enmity and atheism, the extent of its desperate unbelief. All unbelief is a rejection of the Son of God. Whatever be its evasions and subterfuges, excuses and fair pretenses, this is its essence, rejection of the Christ of God. Why this desperate rejection, this feeling of man toward the Christ? For many reasons, but chiefly for this, that God's religion, of which Christ is the beginning and the ending, is so thoroughly opposed to man's religion, or man's idea of religion, that to accept Jesus as Nazareth would be a total surrender of self, a confession of the utter absence of all goodness, an overturning of every religious idea or principle which the flesh had cherished and rested upon. Man's alternative is the denial of self or the denial of Christ, the rejection of his own claims to be his own saviour or the rejection of the claims of Christ, the crucifixion of the flesh, or the crucifixion of Christ. Allow unbelief to take its own way and run its course, and it will end in the crucifixion of the Lord of glory. It will prefer self, the flesh, the devil, the worst of criminals, to Christ. Not this man, but Barabbas. So what was this will? What was the moving spring of their fierce resolution that Jesus of Nazareth must die? It was their will that this stern censor of their manners and morality should die. This was perhaps the first and largest reason for their hate. They writhed under his vehement denunciation of their sins, the bold hand which rent off the cloak of their sanctity and revealed the foul stink of corruption that was beneath. They willed that the witness to the truth should die. The Lord belonged to another world which they did not care to enter, a world which troubled their selfish, sensual lives. Men hate the witness of truth when they are bent on transgression. They cannot bear it. They will not. They willed that the teacher of the people, the friend of publicans and sinners, should die. They were a ruling class a caste, and as such rulers hate, none so bitterly as those who speak loving, quickening, emancipating words to the poor. The common people heard it gladly. As society was then constituted in Judea, that meant that he or the rulers must fall. There was something more deep and more malignant than this. 
It was their will that the Saviour should die, one that cannot shake off the impression, reading the Gospel narratives, that the rulers knew him. Nicodemus was not without vision of the truth. Others must have shared his ideas. They felt that he had come to save them, and they would not be saved. This was the will of the Jews. But what, meanwhile, was the will of God? St. Peter explains it in Acts 2.23. Him, being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. How is this? It was God's will as well as their own. As far as the act was concerned, the Father delivered the well-beloved Son into the hands of the Jews. To understand this, we must consider that it was not possible that God, man, should be wary of death. The Jews willed that he should die, but what he was, what they hated, would never die. Through death, the power of Christ, his witness to the truth, his witness against sin, his redemptive work for mankind became living, all-pervading, and almighty realities in the world.
Let us pray. Lord, we beseech you to keep your household, the church, in continual godliness, that through your protection it may be free from all adversities, devoutly given to serve you in good works, to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.